Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap Podcast. My name is David Parsons. I thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're doing well. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, it was a long time coming. This one, uh, uh, I finally got to sit down with Professor Eric Foner at Columbia University. Uh, many of you probably know the name Eric Foner. Uh, he's a towering figure in American history, uh, someone whose work, uh, in particular on re- the Reconstruction era, uh, completely rearranged the historiography. Uh, and you can't, you can't really consider Reconstruction anymore uh, without knowing Foner's work. Uh, we talk about that book and how he created it, uh, but we also talk about his philosophy of history, uh, the different figures that he's encountered over the years, from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who he met in the early 60s, uh, to Richard Hofstetter and Herbert Gutman uh, and many others, and we also snuck in some riffs on Obama, uh, on the, the Bush family, on the Clinton family, uh, and lots of other great stuff. This was a, a really fun uh, a, a, and, and a amazing experience to, to go to Columbia and talk to uh, Eric Foner. Uh, fulfilled a young historian's dream to talk to him. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, you can find more Nostalgia Trap uh, episodes on iTunes. Uh, you can go to Stitcher.com and download all the episodes. Uh, and if you like the Nostalgia Trap Facebook page, you'll get updates on new episodes and other stuff like that. I hope you enjoy this conversation. This is me and Professor Eric Foner. discovered when I was later on, you know, when I was growing up and I'd have dinner at friends' houses that not everybody talked about politics, right. and, but generally they talked about cars or mm. TV shows or other things. But, you know, I, I, my, my father and Uncle Philip, my father Jack Foner, Uncle Philip Foner were historians, two other uncles, Henry Foner and uh, Mo Foner were major labor leaders in New York City. Um, my father... Uh, all of them actually had been blacklisted in one way or another starting in the early 40s. And certainly when I was growing up in the McCarthy era, they was, you know, now the two in the union movement had another avenue, but my father and uncle didn't. Um, so, and, you know, people, we, we, my family, we, we, they were friends with uh, Paul Robeson and mm-hmm. W.B. Du Bois. Yeah. Of course, when you're seven or eight years old, you don't understand That's who, what those, I was wondering who is, those people are yeah. until looking back on retrospect. Oh, boy, I met <laughs> Paul Robeson when I was three years old. But, you know, what, <laughs> but um, the, so, yeah, politics was very widely discussed in my family. So it was, I just learned it growing up, you know, just mm. a by osmosis, so to speak. Mm. Um, in terms of, of blacklisting, was it your father, that happened in the early 40s, isn't yeah, that yeah. right? Yeah, 40, 40, 41, early 41, there was this, what they called the Rap Coup d'Air Committee, a committee of mm-hmm. the New York legislature, which investigated uh, so-called communist influences in the city university system, mm. and somewhere around 40 or 50 faculty were fired or forced to resign mm. Uh, as a result of that, and uh, my father and uncle were two of them. Some of them went on to become very prominent. Mm-hmm. Moses Finley, the great ancient historian, mm-hmm. who was then Moses Finkelstein, was fired and you know ended up in England later on and knighted. So you know, I was only <laughs> only in America can a can a uh, blacklisted communist become <laughs> sir. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a, it's almost like a mark of, uh, of honor from that era to be blacklisted. I, I would certainly say that. Of course, it was. It, it's better than, you know, the way to avoid it was to just turn on your friends and yeah. become an informer. And neither my father or my uncle were that kind of person. Mm. On the other hand, they suffered a great deal because of it. If you yeah. lose your livelihood, it's a Big problem, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the the, the small amount that I, that I've read and doing research for for talking to you about mm-hmm. your father it seemed to indicate that, and, I, and you can probably verify this, but I thought it was an, a, a connected to your your history and your your politics is the the idea of uh, he he the, he had a uh, an overemphasis on the centrality of, of black people in the history of well, the United both States. of them did. You know, my father wrote a book about uh, blacks in the American military. Mm-hmm. Uh, my uncle Phil in effect, discovered or invented Frederick Douglass. I mean, his four-volume 
collection published in the early 50s of the writings of Frederick Douglass was one, a fantastic thing, you know, mm. and it really, nobody had heard of Frederick Douglass at that point. It's today, incredible to think about. Yeah, nobody you, had today heard you it, cannot yeah. avoid Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. I mean, if any black person popped up in a textbook at that time, it was Booker T. Washington or maybe George Washington Carver with his peanuts. Sure, yeah. Douglass wasn't mentioned, and it was, my uncle was the first one to really pull together volumes of his great writings and speeches and really made people aware of what an important, brilliant guy Frederick Douglass was. So, and many other things. My uncle wrote histories of African Americans. He published documentary histories, as well as, um, you know, labor history. It was also his mm -hmm. main bent. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that among outside the black universities mm -hmm. at that time, the only white people who cared about black history were communists, basically. Herbert Seems Aptheker, so. Yeah. You know, I mean, and most white people couldn't care less mm -hmm. uh, at that time. And, um, uh, you know, so in the, in the mainstream universities, black history didn't exist. Mm. Uh, there was no course at Columbia University in African American history until I taught one in 1969. Mm. I, I mean, I just spoke with David Nassau a, oh, couple, right. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, he says hello, and, he, and he, he, he talked a lot about the 1968 strike and the, the coming about of black studies here at right, Columbia. Right, right, yeah. exactly. It didn't come just out of the goodness of the hearts of the administration or anything right. like that. But... Um, you know, so, right, so the, the centrality of race, the centrality of the African-American experience in our history was something that I learned just growing up and which most white people didn't really think about that at the time in the 50s. Also, just the, the place of dissenters in American history. You know, the people mm -hmm. I heard about were Tom Paine and Eugene V. Debs mm. and uh, putting Douglas on the other side, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you know, and um, other people, and you know, the, the, that those were not people who you heard about in American history classes mm. in uh, in the 1950s. You know, That's so fascinating. In a, yeah. in a certain sense, I I grew up just absorbing a view of history which later became the mainstream. You the, know? the the history from below yeah, idea, but, yeah, but uh, that didn't exist at that time <laughs> except in these small circles. Well, so how how did you become? Uh, it sounds like it was almost a foregone conclusion that you were going to study history in college, but but that would, would have been the it, late but, 1950s. That yeah, you but it was, I well I came, I entered Columbia College in '59. Okay, but I was not, I did not want to become a historian. <laughs> I was I was actually a little nerd in uh, of that time I was interested in math and science and mm. astronomy I had a little telescope which I used to put out on the lawn and look what at what we things. call stem now yeah, yeah. right uh, <laughs> you know I was on the math team in my high school you know so I wanted to be an astronomer actually mm. and the first two years of college I mostly took science math courses not yeah. history I didn't take any history course until I was a junior in college uh, partly what happened was well, two things happened. One, three, many, but one, I kind of ran out of ability at a certain point in mm. advanced calculus and things like this. I just found it very difficult going. Uh, number two, um, you know, by the early 60s, the whole society was, the, the, the civil rights yeah. movement was, you know, with the sit-ins was mm -hmm. reaching its, you know, militant phase. And this led a lot of us to start thinking about where this was coming from in mm. American history. And then I took a course with a great inspiring teacher, James Shenton, here when mm -hmm. I was a junior mm -hmm. uh, on the Civil War era, a year-long seminar, and it, you know, when it, this is just a lesson for all of us to remember, an inspiring teacher can really have a tremendous impact on yeah. people. So I, it was taking the course with Shenton that made me want to be a historian, even though I had already learned a lot of history at home, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, I mean, uh, did you meet, you said you meet, you met Du Bois, but you were well, very, I met very Du Bois. young. I, I, you know, that, uh, I think I met Du Bois in 1960. I know it must have been 1960. So I was then 17. I was old enough, but I hadn't really learned that much about Du Bois in yeah. high school. He was living in Brooklyn at the time with his wife, Shirley Graham, mm -hmm. and my, my parents and my younger brother and I went out to visit them, and um, we had been, my brother and I had been picketing uh, Woolworth stores here yeah. Yeah. in sympathy with the sit-in people mm -hmm. in the South. Mm -hmm. And Du Bois, all I remember from this meeting is Du Bois said, oh, I would love to be out there picketing too, because, but Shirley won't let me. His wife. I mean, he was like 94 years yeah, old. Yeah, that's what I would imagine. He was yeah, very so old he, at this point. He wasn't ready to be out on this picket line, really. But, you know, right. he, 
that was that's what I remember hearing from Du Bois, you know. Mm. So it's, it sounds like um, you know, and, and this makes sense to me considering your 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 body of work that that you know, studying history is in part a political project for you. Well, yeah, you know, I always tell students the current the world you're in gives you your quest mm. of what you want to study. It doesn't give you your answers. But the questions, you know, the, the, I was just one of a whole generation of people who began looking into the history of race, the history of slavery, mm. the history of anti-slavery. Uh, yeah, it was a political endeavor in the sense that we were trying to figure out how the society got to the crisis it was in yeah. by the mid-1960s. When I was, you know, I graduated from college, I went over abroad for two years to study in England, and then I came back and I started working on a dissertation and by then, the mid-60s, the whole society was falling apart. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, the war, the civil rights revolution, all sorts of things. And, um, yeah, so the new, we, we were trying to, f people like me were trying to figure out what kind of history is relevant to the moment we're living in. Because the history yeah. we had learned, the so-called consensus school, mm -hmm was irrelevant. <laughs> when the society is falling apart, the notion that there's never been any disagreements in American history and that everyone's part of a consensus just, in other words, that was a past out of which the present could not have grown. Yep. So we had to find a different history to explain what we saw in the streets, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, and it seems like your investigation uh, ultimately centered on, on the period of time right after the Civil War, and it seems like... Well, um, my dissertation was before the Civil War, mm. was the Republican Party. I was interested in anti-slavery politics. How did a s small group get to be a large group and change, you know, the political structure of the country? Yeah. And, you know, my, my PhD supervisor was Richard Hofstadter. Yeah. A great historian and... Mm -hmm. Legendary historian. Yeah, legendary historian. And, you know, the kind of questions I was asking were Hofstadter questions. They're mm -hmm. about political culture, yeah. political ideology, mm -hmm. the relation between politics and society. In, in a sense, you know, my dissertation, which had a pretty big impact because this notion of ideology was just coming back into vogue. Bernard Balin's book, The Ideological yeah. Origins of the American Revolution, mm -hmm. um, some others... And, you know, previously, you know, one of the great uh, tropes of the 1950s was there is, you know, there's no ideas. In, uh, this is European stuff, people fighting on an ideological basis. Mm -hmm. We have a consensus. We're all just good liberals here, classical liberals. Uh, Hofstadter was part of that, but Hofstadter was a good enough teacher and historian to say, you go and do what you want to do. He didn't try to force us into his mold. Mm -hmm. The questions were kind of half set of questions, but he in no way tried to say, oh, no, you know, you're overemphasizing ideological conflict too much. Not yeah. at all. Actually, the biggest influence on me in, at that moment really probably was Eugene Genovese, mm -hmm. who yeah. had just published The Political Economy of Slavery mm -hmm. in 1965, and uh, which gave you a social and ideological account of the coming of the Civil War. And in some ways, I was trying to do for the North what Genovese had done for the South right. yeah. in explaining how a particular society generates a particular ideological stance and how that leads the North into this conflict, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, the South. So, you know, I was very close to Genovese for a long time. Eventually, he went crazy. And <laughs> um, that's a whole other story. Yeah. But, you know, but for 10 years, I was very, very close to him. Um, Richard Ho Hofstadter wrote that you know, famously about McCarthyism, right? And in, in, during that era, how, how much of that was kind of overshadowing what you were doing? You know, not really. Uh, Hofstadter, you know, the McCarthy experience, I think, soured Hofstadter on mass politics altogether. You uh -huh. know, he he. Then you, you know, he wrote the paranoid style right. just around this time. But he basically just retreated from politics. He just felt that there is this kind of mass politics produces irrationality. Mm. And, you know, he was a good liberal. <laughs> government by experts. Sure. Government by the administrative state. You know, yeah. the, of course, he's a new dealer. The government should help people. But it's not that, that when mass politics gets involved, then all sorts of crazy ideas come mm. to the fore. Yeah. And... Um, I didn't share that view at all. And then the 60s upheavals reinforced that in his view, yeah. you know. Uh, but now it was right in the university, not just farmers and <laughs> populists out in the Midwest somewhere, you know. People were seizing buildings right here at Columbia. So he became very freaked out about that, of course. Many of his students were involved. And again, he never told us 
you can't do this, you can't do that. He tried to understand what yeah. people's views were, even though he, didn't, he wasn't particularly sympathetic. But I think he just abandoned politics altogether, fundamentally. That's interesting. That's really amazing, actually. And he, and he died rather young. He at, died in 1970 at age 54. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, as, as you began to study Reconstruction, how much, I mean, how much were you thinking about um, – I don't know, the word, that word and that ideology of capitalism, you know, uh, and how well, much it you had know, to here's, do with it. Uh, to go back a little, I, uh, as I said, my education at Columbia was pretty conventional, uh-huh. um, which was great. I, I, it was political history, ideal, intellectual history, you know, and it was only then a few years after I got my PhD, I went back to England I had a grant, and I started working on what became this book on Thomas Paine, mm. and I came into contact with people whose works I had never really encountered before, Eric Hobsbawm, E.P. Mm. Thompson, mm-hmm. that whole yeah. British mm-hmm. Marxist social history group, and that really got changed or expanded my approach to history considerably. Mm-hmm. You know, And my book on Paine is about ideas, but it's also about social history and social yeah. movements and trying to link Paine into the you know the world of these radical artisans and mm-hmm. uh, things like that, um, so and then I was asked to write this book. I wasn't planning to write about Reconstruction. It was just serendipity. I was asked by, it's back the mid seventies, I guess, by um, Richard Morris, the mm-hmm. uh, great labor uh, colonial historian who. Um, was one of the editors of this New American Nation series Harper and Rowe was publishing. And basically, David Donald, who had been supposed to write the book on Reconstruction, decided he didn't want to do it. And um, uh, Morris just called me up and said, would you be interested in writing the book on Reconstruction in this series? And Mm. I thought about it. I said, yeah, sure, it makes sense. I did the Republicans before the Civil War. Those books are primarily syntheses of secondary literature. but. For, for complicated reasons, I quickly decided I couldn't do it that way, that the, st- the literature didn't tell the story I was interested in telling. And I then embarked on a very extensive research project mm-hmm. all over the South to trying to, t- in other words, I wanted to do, I wanted to combine all the different kinds of history I was, yeah. sort of had been educated to do. The national history, the political history, the intellectual history, mm-hmm. but also the grassroots militancy of black people in the South and the local social history of Reconstruction Mm. and try to put it all into a coherent story, which was quite a challenge. Capitalism is part of it. Um, You know, the book is, uh, when the book came out, um, there was a session on it at one of the conventions, I can't remember the OAH or the Southern, uh, and uh, and Nell Painter and uh, Armstead Robinson, who unfortunately passed away later on, were commenting, you know, and one of the, I, and I can't remember which was which. I think it was Armstead. Well, one of them, I can't remember. One of them said, that there's a fine book, but there's too much emphasis on race and not enough on class. And the other mm-hmm. one said, no, 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 it's the other way around. Right. There's too much emphasis on class mm-hmm. and not enough on race. And I said, hey, you guys should fight it out among yourselves before I have to respond. Yeah. But in a certain sense, they were right. They were in the sense, it, I'm trying to combine those different kinds of analysis in that book. So yeah, capitalism is central to the story mm-hmm. in the expansion of capitalism after the Civil War, the way the Civil War yeah. catalyzes a sort of a capitalist revolution, particularly in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, it's not, ju- you know, the race question is central to the politics of Reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And other things, nation building, the creation of a modern national state, mm-hmm. citizenship, issues like that. So, um, you know, I was trying to juggle several major conceptual categories. Capitalism was one of them, but yeah. not the only one. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that question of, the, you know, how race and class interact within <laughs> That's capitalism. an old one. <laughs> yeah, the, the left is screaming at each other still about I that. I know. And, yeah. you know, there is no single answer to that, <laughs> simple answer right. to that question. Right. Uh, um I wanted to ask you about uh, a, a book that I, I saw just now that, that, that maybe will bring us to a different time period. We can go back to Reconstruction. But yeah. I, I just saw, I was at the New York Historical Society just now, and, and I saw on the, on the shelf a small book that I'd never seen before by, Phil, by Philip Foner about uh, labor in the Vietnam War. A small, a small book. Do you know yeah. that book? Well, Phil <laughs> wrote over 100 books. That's, I, I, I imagine I could find a million little books and, like uh, that you by know, Philip That Foner. was one of them. And he, yeah. well, you know, his major emphasis was as a labor star. And he yeah. wrote this multi-volume history of the labor movement. He wrote black. He did a multi-volume 
uh, documentary collection of works uh, of documents on black labor in America, mm-hmm. a very mm-hmm. valuable series. And he wrote books on the labor in women, labor in blacks, labor in the Vietnam War. Now, of course, uh, here he was writing from within the family because my two uncles, his brothers, Henry Foner and Mo mm-hmm. Foner, mm-hmm. were major leaders of labor against the war. Yeah. As you well know, uh, the official AF of L, George Meany and those people yep. were all Cold Warriors and pro-war, but mm-hmm. there was a significant you know, anti-war, more socially conscious labor uh, 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 activism during the war. Uh, so I don't even remember exactly what Phil said in that book, but I'm uh, well. Sure. I want to pick it up because uh, because it, it it goes to against a very common perce- yeah. perception about the Vietnam War and who supported it and who well, didn't. Well, you yeah. know, my uncle, eleven ninety nine, the uh, drug and hospital workers here, which my uncle was a major figure in, had Mo major opposition to the mm-hmm. war, the fur and leather workers union, major, and then eventually some of the more liberal, you know, the steel workers, auto began yeah. to become more critical as time went on, you know. Uh, once the establishment split over it, then there was room for labor to maybe take a more dissenting point of view. Mm. And, and it seems like you know, when you talk about you know steel and all these different manufacturing unions, how, how much manufacturing has gone away in the years since. Seems oh, like well, they, they it's a whole other story. Anymore. I mean, the war was a big boon. You know, the, the Vietnam War, among many other things, was the last industrial war. Mm. You know, how do you mean that? What I mean is it required massive production mm. of physical goods <laughs> right today we fought, we are fighting wars or even the iraq war it, it somehow it's all mechanized or, or mm-hmm. automated and you know mm-hmm. drones and all this kind of stuff and it doesn't it doesn't the war the military industrial complex isn't what it used to be yeah <laughs> poor yeah. guys yeah i know <laughs> uh, you know certainly boeing and the aircraft people are but the you know, we're not making tanks and uh, all these other vehicles the yeah. way we used to and other manufacturing things, which, you know, world, whether it's World War II or Vietnam, which kept the manufacturing world humming. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm very aware of this because uh, for a completely different reason, uh, my wife and I have a little house we spend the summer in in northwestern Connecticut, mm-hmm. just north of what they call the Brass Valley, which uh, Jeremy Brecker, good to start, wrote a whole book about mm-hmm. the, the Naugatuck River, River Valley, which used to be a major man- brass manufacturing, the center of brass manufacturing okay. in the United States. Yeah. The last gasp of that was the Vietnam War. They were already declining, but the Vietnam, I don't know, maybe artillery shells or whatever the hell they needed this brass for, Mm. created a boom in the Brass Valley in the mid-60s, late 60s. But once the war ended, it's all gone. Yeah. There isn't a piece of brass being manufactured in that valley anymore, you know? Well, to go along that, I mean, it almost seems like the Vietnam War was the last kind of total social project kind of war. Well, right? it was a war yeah. where you had actual people fighting who were, uh, you know, typical of the, you know, the, you had a draft, which we yeah. don't have anymore. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, and it was, you know, we had half a million troops over there at a certain point, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was a gigantic operation, uh, but that's... That's a whole other question. Obviously. Yeah, I want to go back to the, another gigantic industrial yeah. war. Which, uh, um, when you're writing about, it sounds like you were you were asked to write a book about Reconstruction. You realize I want to bring to bear, I want to bring all these different types mm-hmm. of history to bear on this project. Um, and 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 one of the things I wanted to ask you was many historians that I've talked to on this program mention uh, Herbert Gutman. I don't know how influential he was. Well, yeah, on, very. On, you know, I I when I got I got my P- PhD in '69. Mm-hmm. I taught for three years here at Columbia as an instructor, assistant professor. Okay. Then I was basically let go mm. in 72, beca- or certainly told I was never going to get tenure because uh, for whatever reason, but one of them was Columbia was pretty broke at that time mm. after 68 and mm. all this. Mm. Um, but Gutman, Herbert Gutman, great labor historian, social historian, had just been hired to run this, the um, history department at City College yeah. and to re- revitalize it. And he offered me a job, and there were, you know, there was he had brought together a very fine group of young scholars: myself, uh, Virginia Yans, who's now over at Rutgers, uh, Leon Fink, mm-hmm. very important labor yeah. historian, Eric Perkins, who not as well known, but a very good young black scholar. Mm-hmm. He was building a very good, and he was there himself. He was building a very good core of American historians. Um, I taught some people there who went on to become great historians. Mm-hmm. Joshua Freeman was a student of mine yeah. in the mm-hmm. MA program there. Steve Fraser was a student of mine in the MA program. Graham Hodges was a student of mm-hmm. mine. Very good. All right. Um, 
So, Gum, uh, yes, I got to know Gutman very well, and I was, yes, I was very influenced by his, he was the American sort of equivalent of some of the British social the history. The E.P. Thompson kind of school. Yeah, yeah, although he didn't have any theoretical interests the way <laughs> they did. They were coming out of a pretty classical Marxist background yeah. and moving in a more, I think, you know, diverse direction. Gutman was, had no interest in ideology, really, or some people would say methodology, <laughs> but he was a fantastic digger up of things yeah. and uh, really showed you how you could get at the experience of ordinary people mm. in, in American history. Mm. Um, so, I, yeah, I was very close to government. Unfortunately for all of us, when the New York City fiscal crisis hit in 75, one of the things they did was fire everybody yeah. at the city university who didn't have tenure. I had just gotten tenure a couple of months before, but the other people I mentioned were all let go Wow! because they didn't have tenure, and uh, that decimated the department. Gutman decamped for the City University Graduate Center, yeah. but I kept pretty close to him until he died, in, like in the mid-'80s, I think, a long mm -hmm. time ago. So, uh, But, um, yeah, so it was he, he did have a pretty big influence on my efforts to bring social history into this story. Yeah, but, um, so uh, so many of my histor my um, uh, professors at the CUNY Graduate Center just mentioned him and spoke very highly of him and were very influenced by his, uh, I, not only his out outlook on history, but his personality, I think. Well, his personality yeah. was outsized. He was a very uh, jovial and uh, outspoken guy and very <laughs> generous. I mean, he could, uh, it caused a problem for me in the 70s because he and Genovese were at each other's throats. Yeah. <laughs> and I was pretty close to both of them, and each of them kept wanting me to side with them and declare the other one an enemy, which I didn't feel <laughs> like doing. Uh, and so it got a little bit um, uh, awkward at certain points. Yeah. But I tried to maintain cordial relations with them until <laughs> it was impossible with Genovese. It's not that I chose him, but Genovese was the kind of guy who was, if you didn't agree with him 100% on everything, you were his enemy. Uh. So somewhere in the 70s, I was declared his enemy. It was like, you know, Gene had been a young communist uh -huh. back in the 40s. And um, he, even though he no longer was, you know, a, a communist exactly, he still maintained the Stalinist frame of mind. Mm -hmm. You're either for me or against me. There is no middle ground. There's a party line, which is my point of view. And then either you follow it or you're out. And that, you know, that wasn't my mode of thinking really you always meet the, some of those characters around yeah. the academy it seems like um while you're looking at all this history from below as you're beginning to look at uh writing your book on reconstruction did you, did you have a sense i mean it's all of us as historians that come after you you know we we all <laughs> we all know your turn that that, <laughs> that you made this incredible contribution to the way we think of reconstruction and all did right, you have a you. did you have a sense that uh that was going to, that of what you were going to find, in other words? Because, I mean, you're a little well, bit of a de detective you know, No, here. I mean, I wanted, I knew that this story had been mistold, although, you know, I wasn't the only one. By, by first of all, Du Bois had written Black right. Reconstruction, but that was persona non grata in the academic world. No, nobody in the mainstream. Is that from the 20s that he wrote that? 30s, 30s mid, mid okay. 30s. Uh, but it's a great book, but yeah. it, it wasn't taught, you know. More influential, in a way, was Kenneth Stamp mm -hmm. in 1965 had published a short book, The Era of Reconstruction, which was a very classic revisionist work. Now, Reconstruction wasn't as bad as they said. Mm -hmm. Civil rights, the 14th Amendment, you know. What, what he didn't do was really look deeply at what was going on in the South. His yeah. book was about the national progress on civil rights, and it was very much a book, you know, written in the middle of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But as the 70s went on, more and more scholars were writing about different local aspects of Reconstruction. They were looking at things which Stamp hadn't looked at, like uh, the transition from slave labor to free labor, mm -hmm. the rise of sharecropping, uh, the rise of black local black office holding. So, you know, I was doing a lot of research, but I was very fortunate that as I was working on this book, every year important monographs were coming out. <laughs> you know, on this. It was sort of like the 60s on slavery, where right. every time you turned around, some important book was coming out, and the shift of scholarly attention in the 19th century moved from slavery to Reconstruction. Not that slavery was ignored, but I think, you know, a lot of the energy went that way. So, yeah, I mean, I saw my task as synthesizing all this stuff, but trying to make sense of it, because, yeah. you know, there was so many different... How, can you, how do you bring the national and the local into dialogue? How do you get the economic history and the political history and the social history mm -hmm. and the 
history of the churches and of other things and schools into a coherent narrative. One thing I learned from Hofstadter, I'm a believer in narrative. Yeah. I think you write chronology is one of our great weapons as a historian, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't just abandon it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 by the time I was writing it, I thought, you know, yeah, this could be a very important book, but you never know yeah. <laughs> when you're writing until it's finished. But at least, you know, I knew that no one had done this in a sense since Du Bois, and Du Bois had done it in a completely different way. I mean, his basic insights, most of them, I think, hold up, but it was a different yeah. kind of book, you know, a different era, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, I, at least I, I knew... I'm telling a story here of what I think happened. It's not just to say, oh, the old Dunning School was wrong. Right. That, that doesn't tell you what did happen. And, you know, if people want to challenge what I've done, they're going to have to go out and do a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, I think that's what's appealing about the type of history that you, you do is, is that narrative thrust that gives it a kind of novelistic feeling. But you're also, you know, you're making points about things that are, that the points are emerging from the evidence in a sense. It's well, not... it's, I like to call it an analytical narrative. Yeah. It's not just one thing after another, but the 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 structure of the thing is itself analytical, and mm. uh, but but nonetheless, it is telling a story, and people do like to read stories yeah. of one kind or another. It must be, um, we, you know, you wrote about George W. Bush about something, a, a piece <laughs> about to, to, just to jump ahead because yeah, it just yeah. seems it seems it must be. Um, it must be incredible to be inside your head while the history that, that has happened in the last, I guess, 15 years in this country I mean, uh, um, has happened. But especially in the last few years since Obama's become president, the, the idea of uh, the state of black America seems like a conversation that is, that is starting. Well, yeah, and I think one of the most gratifying things that I saw recently, now where was it? It was somewhere... I don't, it wasn't in Jacobin, but it was another place like that. A, I don't know who, I don't, I don't know, but a young activist was writing mm -hmm. about this business, the state of black America and all this, you know, and uh, Ferguson and everything. But in the middle of this article, almost out of the blue, he said, you know, every, everybody I know who's active in fighting against racial injustice has read Eric Foner's Reconstruction. <laughs> so I said to myself, that is cool. I'm yeah. glad to see that. You yeah. know, that's great because... Um, there is a, and one of the points there is that scholarship can have a political impact. There, yeah. There's all this talk about public intellectuals, which is fine. People addressing the public directly, and the, and then on the other hand, you get people, oh, well, why aren't historians writing for the public? They're mm -hmm. too into, but you know, yeah, of course we should write for the public, but there is nothing wrong with serious, deeply researched scholarship. And that can also have an impact, yeah. even even though it's not maybe a giant bestseller or something like that. You know, uh, it becomes. I mean, it it becomes a kind of foundational, internalized kind of right. point for for a lot of people. I think. Um, the I brought up the Bush thing because you you had written something <laughs> about uh, Bush being a, 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 a you know one of the worst presidents. The worst president in American history. Well, you know, look, that is public intellectual, and I'm not I'm not saying I I, I think. That was written at the heat of the moment. Will Lentz did that Rolling Stone one, too. Right? He and I yeah. both did that around the same time. <laughs> yeah. Both of them, I, I wouldn't put that little piece of mine in my top ten things I've no, ever no, written. No, no, I didn't bring it up for that. No, no, no I'm yeah. just saying that it was written at a moment of intense hostility for to sure. what Bush was doing for good reason, the, the war in Iraq and mm -hmm. other things. And uh, Washington Post asked me to rank Bush, and now I've changed my mind. He's not the worst president in American history. He's only the second worst. I'm back to the idea that Andrew Johnson was the worst president in American <laughs> history. But um, you got caught up in the heat of the, the right. Bush. But thing, you know, the yeah. funny thing is, Bush, to his credit, <laughs> this is a, as we head towards perhaps another Bush. In yeah, case. another yeah. one. Well, yeah. when my article appeared, I in U.S. USA Today, that sort of newspaper. Yes. Yeah. Sort of newspaper. <laughs> a reporter from USA Today had an interview with President Bush and said, you know, this historian, oh, Foner, has said you're the worst president in American history. What do you think of that? And Bush gave the right answer, which was future historians will have to figure that out. I'm not, you know, which is correct. It is, it is absurd to say in the midst of someone's presidency, this is the worst or the best, you know. So I, I'm not saying, I, I, I will uh, step back a little bit on that, yeah. even though I think what Bush did in general was horrible. Um, but uh, that's why I ref did not contribute. The, the New York Magazine had mm -hmm. this thing recently on historians ranking Obama. It's not over yet. 
So I said, <laughs> I don't want to get involved in this. Yeah, yeah. I can't rank Obama in the middle of his presidency. That's absurd. Get back to me in 15 years and I'll get rank Obama. You know. Well, I wonder, I mean, how much did you uh, and, and get caught up in that? I, I, because, I mean, I, I think a lot of us did. Even on, not even, I mean, people on the left in general got very excited about Obama af, because of, he came after Bush. Yeah, you know, of course. Yeah. I, I was excited about Obama, too, to my regret in some ways. Mm. Uh, we had big fights in my family. My wife was a Hillary person, you know. Uh, oh, on that all, was a that was a nasty primary. It was well, yeah. not only on gender grounds. I mean, she thought it was about time we had a woman president, sure. which I can't disagree on that point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, political also, that she didn't really trust Obama. She didn't. She said he's not really a liberal, as far as I can see. In fact, my wife knew a lot more than I did. She said Car he's like Carter. This guy is another Carter, in the sense he doesn't trust. Politics. He's mm. not a politician. Mm. He's a, he's like a progressive from a hundred years ago. <laughs> he he believes in expertise and administrative government. And when you, you know, I didn't quite see that. I, in, like many people, I invested into Obama many qualities that I wished he'd had. Yeah. But he didn't. Mm -hmm. Now he was superior to McCain. I have no problem sure. with that. <laughs> but I think you know many of us were slightly over optimistic about some of the things Obama might be doing. And then, of course, totally un, in an unpredicted way, uh, he came in in the midst of a big financial crisis yeah. and um, could have, I believe, seized the moment to actually change things. Yeah, I, I, I feel didn't. like a lot of us anticipated some sort of, I don't know why we did, yeah. maybe it was projection. But he kept talking about change, change, yeah, that, was his, right. that was his campaign, change, change, change. change. And not only that, but I feel like it's a very cynical slogan, a change you can believe in, which, right. is, which is kind of, you know, a, a, you know, making reference to the idea of the post-Vietnam era almost, that, you know, none right. of us believe in politicians anymore. Yeah, well, you know, look, uh, good for Obama, he outfoxed Hillary in the, oh. uh, in the uh, primary system, and he... Um, got himself elected, he had a 60-member majority in the Senate, he did not provide the kind of leadership. You know, FDR came in in a, in a more serious economic situation, mm -hmm. but people wanted leadership. In that situation, they want leadership. Yeah. They want decisive action. Obama, oh, no, I don't know if I can do this, oh, no, I'm not sure I can do that. You know, he, you had an opening. Mm. To me, the whatever the failure of the Obama presidency is, failed in the first six months yeah. when he was at his peak of power and didn't use it. Now... He didn't create a new uh, WPA or well, something. Well, yeah. I'm not <laughs> suggesting he's going to bring about a socialist revolution, but, you know, the banking system, uh -huh. real regulation, breaking up some of these big banks, which, there, hey, there are people in the Financial Times m newspaper who say the bank should be broken up. Right. This is not a That's not a Marxist position. No, yeah. this is just, you know, to prevent them from destroying everything again. And... Um, and then the healthcare thing, not really pushing for, mm. uh, you know, public option and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Or single payer, which is obviously the right way to go. You know, it's ridiculous, the system we now have. I mean, I don't even know if a, this Affordable Care Act is actually a step forward or backward or sideways or what. I know? think a lot of us are, are, are kind of scratching our heads about that. I uh, mean, it's just that the, the hostility to it is so crazy that one feels like one has to defend it. But, yeah. you know, it, as people have said, it's a conservative. It, it origin This whole system originated in a plan from the Heritage mm, Foundation mm -hmm. in the 1990s uh, in order to enable the insurance companies to survive and profit with a government-mandated system. Right. So, I mean, it seems like uh, to most of us, it seems pretty obvious that, that the idea of profit in the healthcare system is the problem with the healthcare system. Yeah. I thought that we might have an opportunity to remove that, but yeah, I don't well, think... Well, we did, but uh, uh, anyway, all right, look, Obama's had a lot of problems. He certainly has a lot of people who are trying to destroy his presidency, yeah. and he's got crazy Republicans, so... You know, that's we, the we handcuff will, of it is the crazy Republicans. Right. We will let uh, we will wait 20 more years and then come back yeah. and okay. look at it with the, you know, the owl of Minerva takes flight at mm -hmm. dusk <laughs> after things are over. Um, when you see uh, Black Lives Matter happening on the streets uh, um, and, and, and not only in Ferguson, but, uh, but around the country, sure. really, um, how, how do you view that as, as a historian of the Reconstruction era that, that looked at black people? from below, kind of. Do you see it as part of one continuum, or do you think we're in a different moment? Well, it, of uh, course, obviously it's we're 150 in a years yeah. later, obviously, so it's a different moment, and... Um, different ideological you know, moment, I Yeah, suppose. 40 acres and a mule is not really going to be that much use to people nowadays, <laughs> uh, but, um, 
you know, it it is a different moment in the sense that I think the what has happened since the civil rights revolution is the you know um, the tremendous exacerbation of class differences within the black community, right. which didn't that there's no real parallel to that in Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a very small black elite, but very very tiny. The mm -hmm. vast majority of black people were poor ex slaves, etc. Now, as you well know, we've had Obama is a perfect example. We have talented black people mm -hmm. who have taken advantage of the opportunities offered to them by the civil rights revolution and by affirmative action mm -hmm. and have risen to positions that were inconceivable uh, a century and a half ago. Yeah. Uh, and not just in politics, in, in, in corporate world and, you know, in universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the, the absorption of a certain number of non-whites into the up, upper class and the upper middle class, it's still mostly white, but, mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it, that, that has made the whole discussion of race much more complicated. Yeah. I mean, here, like for example, here at my college, um, most students think we are a post-racial society. <laughs> I don't blame them for thinking that. Yeah. That is the experience they've had. They yeah. come to a campus with not enough, but some African-American professors with a pretty diverse student body. They're all from the same social class, mm -hmm. but racially, ethnically, they're quite diverse. Mm -hmm. They have friends of all different kinds. Nobody seems to bother anybody along these lines. So yeah, their experience here is non-racial mostly. Yeah. Um, occasionally things happen, you know, but sure. mostly it's non-racial. Um, but if you step outside and you, you know, and you then step back, well, look at Ferguson or look at incarceration or look at, uh, you name it, life expectancy, in, unemployment. Look at the real rates. estate that Columbia University yeah. owns around I this mean, neighborhood. You, you, you look all over, you, know, the, you, you <laughs> You have to look beneath the non-racial surface yeah. to see the persistence of inequality in this country. Mm. It's inequality within the black community as well as inequality together. But of course, inequality is not just a racial question anymore. Right. It is a fundamental fact of American life mm -hmm. for everybody. Yeah. And this means that the it's, we're no longer having to deal with the question of civil rights, of voting rights, although, of course, voting rights are under attack, you know, in many places. Voter ID laws everywhere. Right, yeah. but the, the economic inequalities mm -hmm. that uh, have, have persisted and gotten worse, actually, um, are, you know, require a different mode of thinking. They yeah. require a kind of thinking that somehow brings race and class into the picture together in some ways. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. It's not the same. The issues are not the same yeah. as in Reconstruction. There's no reason they should be 150 years later, but mm. the fundamental problem of equality is the same. Yeah, I guess what I was thinking about with Reconstruction is, is so much of, uh, of, of, of kind of discourse about Reconstruction talks about <clears throat> the, the criminalization of black life and the idea that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that prisons and law enforcement provided a channel for the state to deal with black people. In well, one that's way or the other. after yeah. Reconstruction, yeah. You know, obviously. I mean, that, they, they tried that very briefly when Andrew Johnson was dealing with Reconstruction. Then mm -hmm. you had radical Reconstruction in which that didn't happen. But then you're absolutely right. The criminalization of black people became mm. a major part of the Jim Crow system, mm. the convict lease system, mass, you know, the beginnings of, of significant incarceration uh, in, in the South. And because uh, under slavery, people weren't put in jail. That yeah. was kind of right. point. That would be pointless. They were already in jail. In yeah. Sense, you know, yeah. you want them to be working, not sitting in a jail somewhere. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of the problem is the declining need, you might almost say, in the economy for black labor. Yeah. You know, uh, automation, deindustrialization, the mm. and you know here again, Obama. I, I don't expect Obama to solve all these questions by himself. No, but, they're huge questions. But he hasn't. Uh, you know, Obama is afraid to address these things in terms of their racial impact. Mm. The fact is that the condition of black people has gotten worse under Obama, not better. Mm. That and that's an incredible statement. I know, uh, and yeah. some of the policies he is pursuing, which are not racial policies, are very detrimental to black people. The mm. free trade. Yeah is hand in hand with deindustrialization, which has devastated the black sort of solid working class, mm. um, the cutbacks in public employment at all levels. Who works for the government? Yeah. I mean, it's mostly non-whites in yeah. many places. Yeah. Well, those jobs are disappearing also in significant numbers. Uh, it's, uh, I think one of the 
the, the biggest kind of revelations about that for me was, was realizing, reading somewhere about how Washington, D.C. was kind of the site of the first black middle class uh, because yeah, the federal government was an employer. Absolutely. Up until uh, Woodrow Wilson came in. Yeah. And then right. he booted them all out. Good Lord. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the idea of a, of a, a, a black working class or a, or a working class in the United States is hard to think about now because of the deindustrialization, because of... Uh, well, there is a working class, obviously, but it's no longer a steel worker. Right. It's no longer... It's Walmart. Oil. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a guy flipping at hamburgers at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. It's a woman working in Walmart. Yeah. Uh, it's a person, an illegal immigrant fixing up hotel room mm -hmm. beds and, you know... There is certainly a working class, but it's not your old industrial working class anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's not gathered together in large factories yeah. where organization is easier, perhaps. So it's a, it's a big challenge to conceptualize and then mobilize. Now, the fact is there are places where this is happening. I mean, some of the movements of low-wage workers, mm -hmm. because... Even though they're not obviously working in one place, they have great community support. They have support from churches. They have support from ethnic, racial institutions. Yep. They often have support from local uh, political leaders. So labor, and you know, they're doing this. Trump has talked about this a lot. Labor has to be a social movement. Mm -hmm. It cannot just be a workplace movement. Right, right. And that's not so easy to do, especially given the money that is deployed against labor, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. and the laws increasingly. But that, it seems to me, is the future of working class activism, yeah. not the more conventional workplace labor organization, although there's certainly a place for that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it seems like, um, you know, you've seen a few different strikes happen in the service sector with fast yeah. food workers and, and, and even Walmart. Um, yeah, it seems like that's the, that's the future because that's where the working need, class is. But you also need political power. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, uh, I'm not a syndicalist where, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, you, you need political power. The law has a big effect. I mean, the, you know, who's on the NLRB has a big effect on whether people can organize or not. Local laws, certainly with public employees, yeah. local laws are very, very important. Even local minimum wage laws, you know, mm -hmm. and so it, politics is part of this. It can't really be yeah. just separated. Out. And we've seen that in Seattle, right? They want a fifteen dollar yeah. minimum wage up there, yeah. and and it's kind of in, incredible because you know, I, I, so people that are, are I guess outside of politics, in my family hear fifteen dollars an hour, and they think it's so much, and it's it's kind of incredible because multiply it by forty <laughs> hours a week and see right. how much you're getting. Yeah, and and from what I understand, you know, if if, if the minimum wage kept up with inflation would be much higher than oh, yeah. $15. Oh, yeah, it's never indexed for inflation. Yeah. The problem is, politically, and this is, a, you know, Obama's a good symptom of that, or we have that in New York with Cuomo. You mm -hmm. elect people who claim to be liberal Democrats, and then when they get in, they're actually conservatives on, yeah. on these issues, you know? And that, that, that's what's kind of funny, uh, uh, and maybe funny is not the wrong word, haunting and heartbreaking about being on the on the left is, is the sense that, you know, uh, um, you know, we the left tends to hate liberals so much. Mm -hmm. And and the idea is like if we even had a liberal e anymore would be, you know, at this point I would take I would take Eisenhower as a, yeah, a you no, know. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I hate to say it. Nixon? Yeah, right, or Richard Nixon. Nixon's domestic policies were a heck of a lot more liberal than Obama's are. I mean and I mean when we get to compare Hillary, Hillary Clinton as president if she were to be president. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's no way of knowing what the hell Hillary will do. Obviously, she's, seems pretty neoliberal to me. She's a Wall Street person, yeah. clearly, and also in foreign policy, she's pretty bellicose. Mm -hmm. But there, once she gets, you know, if she gets in, which I guess the odds are in favor of her getting in at mm -hmm. the moment, but who knows? Ted Cruz threw his hat in. Yeah, I know. So well, we know. I don't see, I don't see him as uh, as a viable candidate. But what do I? I'm not a Republican. They, they picked their own. Speaking candidate. of the paranoid style. Yeah, but. Um, you know, Hillary will, like any of these people, have to respond to events. And if the, the, there is, I think, despite this, a growing liberal sure. activism within the Democratic mm -hmm. Party, and a person like Hillary, I mean, the Clintons are very political people. Yeah. And they're the, going to go where the offense, wind blows. That's what's good about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's bad is they have no principles. <laughs> what's good is they have no principles. Yeah. That's because then they can be it. pushed in a certain direction, you know. 
So uh, we'll see. I, I am, the, the thing I like to do even less than judging current politics is predicting what will happen in the yeah. future. Because yeah. that, it, who knows? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, well, it's been great talking to you. All right, Thank good. you Thank so you. much. We've wandered all over the place, but that's all right. We have, you know, can, I, can, can yeah. you talk about your new book just for one sure, second before course. we go? What, what, is, what is your new book about? Uh, Gateway to Freedom. It's uh -huh. about the Underground Railroad. It's, it's about fugitive slaves. It's about mm. New York City and its role in the irrepressible mm. conflict. Uh, it's, it's a small study, but it does what many of my other books, what it, it tries to do what many of my other books also do, which is in a narrative tell a story which runs up and down the society. Yeah. I've got the story of unknown individual fugitives, mm -hmm. how they escaped, who helped them, how they got to Philadelphia, how they got to New York, where they were sent, people who were assisting them. It's also about national politics, mm -hmm. about the law of fugitive slaves, yeah. court cases, uh, the sectional conflict and how the actions of fugitives are a catalyst for increasing tension between North and South. Some of it is legal history about the, you know, uh, what they call personal liberty laws of the North, which try to obstruct the rendition of fugitives, and then how the federal government tries to deal with that, how these issues get adjudicated in court. So it, it, it's political history, it's social history, it's mm. racial history, it's the history of radicalism. It's all of those things, just trying to use the Underground Railroad to tell that story, yeah. uh, which is an important piece of the struggle against slavery. Yeah, and, and, and whatever you can do to create a, a more, I guess, visceral picture of what that was like, yeah. uh, the Underground Railroad, because I think so many of us get a, a kind of, you know, very tentative kind of description well, yeah, of what mean, this, how this operated. Well, the, the thing is, this all arose by accident. I, I said, my life seems to be determined by accidents. The Reconstruction <laughs> book was an accident. Right. You know? This book was an accident. A student who, who, a few years ago, who, a history major here, who was writing a senior thesis about this abolitionist editor, his, Sidney Howard Gay, <clears throat> and his papers, 80 boxes of them were up in the Columbia libraries, and she said to me one day, you know, in box 72, there's this document about fugitive slaves. It's not really relevant to my work, but you might find it interesting because I know you're interested in slavery. So, right. you know, I didn't think much of it. I One day I go up there, I said, let me see this thing. And it turns out that it's like two little handwritten notebooks. In 1855 and 56, Gay, the journalist who was also a key operative in the Underground Railroad, kept this record of fugitive slaves, over 200 of them, who passed through New York City. Wow. And being a journalist, he interviewed them. By the way, it's online that we have digitalized it, just uh, with a transcript I produced, just Google gay record of fugitives and you'll find it. But he, you know, and he's a journalist, he interviews them. He gets, you get their voice at the time, wow. not just reminiscences later on why they escaped, how they escaped. And this is where you get those visceral individual stories. And it's incredibly diverse. You know, people escape by boat, they escape by train, they escape on foot, they escaped in horse-drawn carriages. Some of them escaped individually, some of them escaped in groups. Mm. Some of them weren't helped by anybody. Some of them knew they could get help if they got to this town or that town. Um, some of them knew a Quaker that just, they didn't know any that Quakers would help you. They, one guy says, well, I got to Pennsylvania, I knocked on a door and I said, Send me to a Quaker. I don't care who. Oh you know? my God! Just that's because just, it had that's gotten, insane. The, new, the word had gotten around among slaves. Quakers will help. Quakers will help you. You know, they probably had never seen a Quaker in their whole right. life. But you know, there are these Quakers, these crazy people who will help fugitive slaves. Yeah. So, and then the local people who were helping them. It's not. You know, we shouldn't think of this as some highly organized system. It wasn't regular routes, regular right. stations, secret codes and password. No. But there were little cadres of activists, and it's mostly about New York City. I mean, one guy, uh, Louis Napoleon, I never heard of this guy, mm. a free black man in New York who, illiterate, by the way, mm. he scoured the docks looking for fugitives who had hidden on ships. When a fugitive is sent up by train from Philadelphia, he'll meet him at the train depot. He went to court to get writs of habeas corpus to try to rescue slaves who'd been captured. Wow. Illiterate, but he does all this stuff. And, you know, so it's these local little groups that are doing this. We shouldn't exaggerate it, but on the other hand, they did manage to accomplish quite a bit. Yeah, and they had no, no Twitter, no internet. No they, Twitter, no internet, but they had Telegraph by this period. They had it's trains. Just unbelievable. They were though. using modern technology yeah. of the 1850s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that sounds like an incredible story. It is. It, it, it really, I, it, I was fascinated. And it's different from any book I've written because it, 
is a lot of it is these very human individual yeah, stories yeah. you know God, i can't wait to read it thanks so much for sitting all with right me. great well Pro- thank you nice to talk to you and uh, we'll see what happens here professor eric foner thank you so much Thank you.